Hey, I'm Dr. Scott Worden, the TOS guy. We have a change of plans for today. I'm a little sorry to announce. One of our participating physicians had a personal health issue to deal with. So we are going to uh, delay that talk probably for two weeks with the TOS cases. And for today, I've created a presentation discussing arm motion and how that affects TOS. So I'm gonna put up a presentation with slides. I'll go through the presentation about arm motion and TOS. Then I'll come back live like this and we'll welcome any questions or comments. Arm motion and thoracic outlet syndrome. We're going to discuss and review the anatomy of the thoracic outlet. For those of you who have seen some of my previous talks, the anatomy section will be a review, but for people who are viewing for the first time, this will be an introduction without too much detail. It should be easy to follow for non-medical people. Next, we'll discuss how arm motion affects the thoracic outlet. And finally, we'll discuss how these changes in arm motion cause TOS. It's very important to know this material. TOS is a form of an entrapment neuropathy. We get these all over the body. Carpal tunnel syndrome, for one, you've probably heard of. But the thoracic outlet and TOS are unique because this arm motion creates a really complex extra factor that doesn't just entrap the nerve, but can do it in many different ways, depending on the person, their anatomy, their musculature, etc. First, let's go over some of the key points of the anatomy of the thoracic outlet. So what is the thoracic outlet? Well, we've got the natural intrinsic structures of the thoracic outlet. We'll take a look at these with some graphics. They include the side of the cervical spine, the top of the chest, the beginning of the shoulder, the rib, the collarbone. The traversing structures are the structures such as the brachial plexus, a big nerve bundle, the subclavian artery, the artery that provides almost all the blood flow to the arm, and the subclavian vein, the vein that drains almost all of the blood flow from the arm. When these structures cross the thoracic outlet, they can be affected, and when they are affected, and they result in symptoms, you get thoracic outlet syndrome. We also have a series of at least three tunnels, as they're classically described by doctors, and you've probably heard of these. The scalene triangle is one. These tunnels are a result of the anatomy of the thoracic outlet, and they change in different patients and with different arm positions. Finally, we'll talk about the dynamic changes or the arm motion that's the key point of this talk. So the intrinsic structures of the thoracic outlet would be bones, muscles, lung, and other soft tissues such as ligaments. Here are the basic bony structures we need to know. The cervical spine or the neck, the first rib at the top of the rib cage, which has 12 ribs on each side, the clavicle or collarbone as it's commonly called, and the scapula or shoulder blade. We'll talk in particular about the collarbone, the clavicle, and the shoulder blade, the scapula. Don't be confused by these medical terms. I'll try to use the regular plain English terms I learned as a kid, make it easy for all of us. Let's start out by looking at some of the muscles. Once the nerves leave the thoracic spine, once the artery and vein leave the chest, they enter the thoracic outlet and they pass between a series of muscles. The most important muscle is the anterior scalene muscle shown here. We're not gonna discuss the anterior scalene muscle in any great detail for today's talk. But you'll be able to see a picture with the anterior scalene muscle and the middle scalene muscle. And these two muscles define the scalene triangle. There's the anterior scalene in front and the middle scalene in back. And between them, we get this space, which we'll outline in purple here. And that is the scalene triangle. You notice that won't change much with neck position or arm motion. It's pretty tight and pretty fixed. But once the nerves and the blood vessels pass through the space, they're going to enter the next tunnel which is a bony tunnel. That's called the costoclavicular interval. Don't worry about the name, it's not important. But what is important is that you can see the first rib and the collarbone. And between those two bones is a bony space. That's the second tunnel 
that the nerves and blood vessels have to go through. Remember, the pathway of these nerves and blood vessels is to either leave the neck and chest and go to the arm or return from the arm and get to the neck and chest. So anything that obstructs them or presses on them or compresses them along the way or puts tension on them can cause symptoms. That's thoracic outlet syndrome. So in this picture again, the first rib and the collarbone, the clavicle, are important to know. You'll notice also that the shoulder blade, the scapula, is attached to the collarbone or clavicle. And this is critically important because movement of the shoulder blade, the scapula, movement of the shoulder blade directly affects movement of the clavicle or collarbone. The first rib should be viewed as not really moving. It's the floor of the thoracic outlet. And when the shoulder blade moves, it causes the collarbone to move. And that gets closer or farther from the first rib, which means it may compress the important structures of the thoracic outlet. Please also note one muscle is listed here, pectoralis minor. It attaches the shoulder blade to the front of the chest wall. There are many other muscles that affect the position of the shoulder blade, and we will look at those. Here's a different view where we can see the nerves, the artery in red, and the vein in blue, and they're passing between the collarbone and the first rib. It can be a normal space or a tight space, but it changes when you move your arms. Then after they leave that space, they go behind the pectoralis minor muscle. Again, you'll see that muscle, pectoralis minor, is attached to the shoulder blade. Now, many of you who are listening might recognize pectoralis minor syndrome or a pectoralis minor tenotomy as treatment for that syndrome. We'll talk a little bit about that later, just a little. But this is where the pec minor, pectoralis minor, arises and attaches. Now, the traversing structures we've already seen are the nerves, the arteries, and the veins. We're not going to dwell on those. They have fancy medical terms. You don't need to know these so well. But let's take a look here and see how the nerves pass between the collarbone and the rib. It's one of the important spaces, but it's the important one that's affected by arm motion. We'll also look at the arteries. On the left side of your screen, the patient's right side, you see the arteries passing between the muscles. And on the right side of your screen, the patient's left side, you see the artery passing between the rib and the collarbone. And that's where the motion can affect the artery. Finally, just for the sake of completeness, here are the important veins that drain each arm and come back to the chest, and they have to go between the rib and the collarbone. So we've got one common space between the rib and the collarbone where all three of these structures may be compressed or stretched. And that's shown here, all three structures. Here's another picture. It's one bundle called the neurovascular bundle. Okay. So, we're going to talk a little bit more about these tunnels. Here's the names of them. They're not important. The names are not important. Understand the anatomy. It's a nice pencil drawing. The anterior and middle scalene muscles, and the first rib, and the collarbone. So you can see already how complex this pathway is for the nerves, the brachial plexus, the artery, and the vein. They have to go between and around these muscles and underneath the collarbone and over the first rib. That space between the scalene muscles is the scalene triangle. Don't worry about the name too much. These are the structures that go through. The brachial plexus and subclavian artery go through the scalene triangle. The vein goes anterior to the scalene triangle but they all three join up and go between the rib and the collarbone. Here's just a different view from the side. Now again, we can see the structures, the anterior scalene and the middle scalene form the scalene triangle, and the first rib is at the bottom of that triangle. Again, you'll see the collarbone or clavicle goes across the top of the first rib. So there in purple is the scalene triangle. But more important for our talk, is this space between the collarbone or clavicle and the first rib. And you'll see this space is called the costoclavicular interval. That means costo for rib, clavicular for collarbone, 
and Interval. Trust me, I didn't make up these names. I just have to agree on it. It's like a little game we play as doctors. This, this image, sorry, this image just shows how those three important structures, the nerves, the artery, and the vein, all come together in that costoclavicular interval. Remember, this collarbone is very mobile. It's directed by the scapula or shoulder blade. So when the shoulder blade moves, the collarbone moves and the rib doesn't. And this is a choke point potentially where any one or all of those structures may be compressed. This just reinforces the pectoralis minor being one of the front muscles that attaches to the shoulder blade. I'm going to move on from this picture for the purposes of our talk. So the second section was how does arm motion, when you move your arms to brush your hair or drive a car or play a game on your iPad, how does that affect the thoracic outlet? So this is a really simple uh, diagram showing the bones, a few muscles, and most importantly, the position of the shoulder. We'll also see the nerves, the artery, and the vein. The next picture will show what happens when you move your arms up. The arm bone goes up. The collarbone moves in an unusual position relative to the first rib. By unusual, I really mean unexpected. It's hard to predict how it will move in any one patient. But we know that it moves and the first rib stays the same. You might notice that the shoulder blade or scapula that's attached to the end of the collarbone has also moved. I'm going to go back. This is with the arms down. This is with the arms up. So the movement of the shoulder blade, again, from here with arms down to here with arms up, will change the position of the collarbone and the first rib does not change for all intents and purposes. Now, this is our friend, the shoulder blade, seen in a couple of views pretty bland looking like this. But you'll notice it's sort of a complex bone. It has lots of little hooks and buttons and attachments and sharp edges. And these are just some of the muscles that attach to the shoulder blade. Turns out there are 17 different muscles that attach to the shoulder blade. They'll either affect the position of the shoulder blade or the position of the arm. Both the arm and the shoulder blade move together to create this complex motion. The arm is the most mobile joint in the human body and it's because of this mobility. Remember that the shoulder blade attaches in front, we can't see it here, to the collarbone. But these muscles and the balance of these muscles will affect the position of the shoulder blade and thus the position of the collarbone. If we look from other angles, again, hopefully you appreciate all of the muscles that attach. You don't need to know which one is which, but you do need to know that there's a ton of muscles Remember we get back aches and neck aches and our muscles may be tight? Well, all of that may affect the position of the shoulder blade and when it does, the collarbone moves. So here's our friend, the collarbone or the clavicle. From this angled picture, the collarbone in blue, you can see is attached to the front of the chest, the sternum or breastbone. And the far lateral or back side of the collarbone is attaching to a small part of the shoulder blade or scapula, which is partly seen here behind the ribs. You'll notice the upper arm bone attaching to the shoulder blade and the clavicle or collarbone attaching to the shoulder blade. Again, I want to reinforce the shoulder blade is very mobile and it moves because of all its muscles and therefore the collarbone moves. With just the bones here, we get another look. The collarbone is now in white, but you see it attaches to the shoulder blade in the back of the rib cage. Now, I want you all to memorize this immediately. That's what my college and medical school professors used to say, and they thought it was funny. This is just part example of how the shoulder blade can move. It just looks pretty scary and confusing. And for that reason, I'm going to show you more just like it. The shoulder blade can slide along the rib cage. It can angle up or down. It can angle in or out, forwards and backwards. It can slide up or down. Here's some more examples of it. People have described this using many different words. But this is important to know because 
the mobility in all these directions of the shoulder blade is very complex and it's affected by those muscles and when it changes the collarbone changes and again just to remind you the brachial plexus goes over the first rib which does not move and under the collarbone so in this picture hopefully you can see on top is the collarbone behind it around the patient's back is the shoulder blade with the arm attached and then underneath it all is the first rib so finally we have to ask ourselves how do all these changes cause TOS let's recall that thoracic outlet syndrome occurs when there is symptomatic compression of the arteries or nerves or veins that pass through the thoracic outlet many people may compress these structures and have no symptoms that's not thoracic outlet syndrome but for all of you who do have pain and tingling and burning and pulselessness and cold hands or warm hands it's because these structures are being compressed or stretched and you're getting symptoms as a result of that um, we all know there's three types of TOS depending on which structure is involved this is an example of a normal we looked at this before there's our scalene triangle there's our costoclavicular interval between the rib and the collarbone and let's compare it the normal on this side to the abnormal with thoracic outlet syndrome you'll see that in the abnormal person there's been strain or injury or overuse and that anterior scalene muscle has gotten inflamed and large now that takes up space it narrows the scalene triangle you'll also notice between the first and second picture that the change in the muscles of the shoulder blade has changed the position of the collarbone look how much closer it is to the first rib and now it's squeezing on those three important structures and if it causes symptoms that's thoracic outlet syndrome you see this circle shows the costoclavicular interval in the normal person and the costoclavicular interval in a person who maybe had a car accident and has neck muscle injury or a patient has been working lifting too much or using their computer too much and now their shoulder blade muscles are too tight and they're unbalanced and that results in this costoclavicular interval being too narrow So we talked about a review of the anatomy of the thoracic outlet and it's important that we understand the underlying structures as well as the traversing structures that go through the thoracic outlet and then we understand the different tunnels where narrowing or stretching can occur. We talked about how arm motion affects the thoracic outlet. In everybody the collarbone gets closer to the first rib but only in patients with TOS does it get too close and causes this compression and how do these changes cause TOS well it's a complex mechanism as I'm sure you understand by now and what we have is we have an imbalance of muscles in the shoulder blade the shoulder blade or scapula takes an abnormal position and that results in an abnormal position of the clavicle or collarbone So, the important points here are that this abnormal balance of muscles around the shoulder blade eventually causes the nerves and the arteries and the veins to be compressed. As probably all of you know, the neurogenic type or compression of the brachial plexus is by far the most common type. And our MRI examination shows all of these structures. We look at the arteries and the veins and the nerves and we look at the muscles and we have a special way to measure the position of the shoulder blade and we can measure the space between the collarbone and the rib and when we look at all these things together especially when we compare arms down to arms up we have a great concentration of data that we can give to the referring doctor who has examined a TOS patient you and this will help with the diagnosis it'll also besides confirming the diagnosis show what the causes are because in each patient the causes may be different in some patients the arm motion is not the primary causer of TOS it's the abnormal scalene muscles if they've had a neck injury or maybe 
the arm where the pectoralis minor is, is too tight. But this is uh, data that we can get from a good MRI examination and when we work with our team members, the other doctors who we talk to all the time. So at this point, we'll, we'd love to have any questions that you have. I know that was a little bit complex and uh, we tried to avoid using too many medical terms because that's not the important point. So anyway, shoot us some questions and we'd uh, love to answer them. I'd also like to reinforce that we have uh, regular TOSeducation.org website listings of new talks that are coming up. Today's talk was uh, rescheduled because, uh, again, as I said, someone has a, a personal issue to deal with. But we're really looking forward to that talk because uh, we're going to take some of the stuff that we've talked about now over several of these live streams. And we're going to put it into practice and show you how three doctors together look at a case. They examine a patient. They put together the physical examination with the MRI findings and other tests if they order them and then come up with a decision about, number one, does the patient have TOS? Number two, what's causing the TOS? And number three, what are the best treatment choices in this case? Sometimes we also use the MRI after surgery because there's been a complication. The patient isn't getting better as quickly as they wanted, etc. So here's a question. Generally, what are the risks for a TOS surgery? Thank you, Jamie. Um, there are a few papers out on the risks. Uh, in general, the immediate post-operative risks are considered to be uh, pneumothorax, where air is leaking around the top of the lung. This is what some people will call a collapsed lung or a perforated lung. And by itself, it's not an issue, but if the air keeps building up, it will compress and collapse the lung, and people can have trouble breathing from that. It's usually easily fixed. Another complication would be infection. With any surgery where you open up the body, there's a chance, albeit small, of infection. But with modern surgical technique, uh, that's a pretty uncommon complication in TOS. It's not a particularly difficult part of the body to keep clean. Uh, another complication would be bleeding. Remember, there are two very big blood vessels in this area, an artery and a vein. And if you accidentally nick one of those, or if one of them is so weakened by the damage of TOS, then you can get bleeding, and those could be a very serious complication. Uh, however, doctors are prepared for this. There's almost always a vascular surgeon on call for emergencies like this during surgery, so it's usually handled well. The patients can get an injury of the lymph nodes. The lymph nodes drain through the entire body, and a big part of that lymph drainage, which is just simple fluid uh, that keeps edema from building up in the body, will come up to what's called the thoracic duct. Uh, actually, I'm sorry, that's on, uh, on this side. Where am I looking? No, it's on this side. Uh, anyway, the thoracic duct drains all the lymph from the body. And uh, if that's injured because it's a very delicate structure, you can get leakage of this lymphatic fluid called chyle. And that can build up. It's a milky fluid that contains fats and other things and just drains the lymph nodes. But if it's not treated correctly, that can build up and be a difficult problem to deal with. Now, some of the things I've seen that aren't in the literature so much are um, you can get a brachial plexitis or a brachial plexopathy, meaning inflammation or irritation after surgery, where the brachial plexus, if it's manipulated too much, can get swollen and inflamed, and that can lead to a lot of ongoing problems. We can also have you know, surgical issues where it was impossible for the surgeon to get out enough of the muscle or enough of the rib. Rarely we'll get some, some docs who do uh, decompression uh, by having uh, taking out part of the rib. Sorry, we had a little camera issue fixing it. And they'll uh, not remove enough of the rib. Um, obviously, in surgery, you can't always move the patient's arm enough, and the patient is uh, asleep under anesthesia. So we don't really know what the effect of the muscles are. So the surgeon takes his or her best guess to remove enough of the first rib, and they may not always get it just right. So we see that occasionally. Uh, other rare complications, people have suggested that a part of the rib after it's removed can grow back. I think that's very rare. I've never seen a case of that and um, never seen a case where it causes more compression. Um, scar tissue can form around the brachial plexus over many months and that may compress the brachial plexus. So I think those are the major complications of surgery. Bear in mind, we still have an imperfect understanding of TOS we're all trying to learn more. And some patients just won't do better from the surgery while others will do great. We don't really have the picture of who and when and what type of procedure 
will work the best in terms of guaranteeing success. Some of the, the best doctors around the country, I was speaking one just a month ago, uh, they say that they think some patients will do great and they don't end up doing great, and other patients they're not so sure of and they do great. So there's still a lot we have to learn about the prognosis from surgery. Thank you for the question. What are the most common symptoms for TOS? This is all new to me. Haley from New York is asking. So let's keep in mind that the most common form of TOS is neurogenic TOS. That's when the brachial plexus gets compressed or stretched. The brachial plexus is a very complex structure. It's the second largest plexus or network of nerves in the human body. And besides being complex in a network, we know that there's a lot of variability between people. The nerves from five different nerve roots, that's five nerve roots come out of the neck and they join up to form this plexus or network. They can branch in very unpredictable ways. So when you press on one spot on the brachial plexus, you may be pressing on the C5 and C7 nerve roots, whereas in other patients, it might be the C8 and T1 nerve roots. Each one of those nerve roots goes to a different spot in the body and therefore causes different symptoms when it's sick or when it's compressed or stretched. So some of this is very difficult to guess. In addition, the nerves sometimes go through the muscles or around the muscles in unusual ways. There are plenty of studies of this in the literature that there's a lot of variability between Joe Smith and Joan Smith in terms of how their brachial plexus leaves the neck and passes through and around the muscles. And therefore, in some patients, a muscle injury may affect the C5 nerve root where the same muscle injury in a different patient may not. But when you compress the nerves, what happens is this. Your brain says, my nerve that goes to my little finger is giving me a pain signal. Now that means my little finger hurts. Now, you could cause that pain by touching a hot stove with your little finger. And then it goes through a normal nerve and the brain says, ouch. But when you press on the brachial plexus, the nerve itself is damaged. So the nerve gives a bad signal, not because something is wrong with your little finger, but because the nerve itself is just giving a signal, it's damaged. Your brain sees it that way though and says, well, my little finger hurts because your brain is wired to understand that nerve comes from the little finger. So um, these are two types of pain that are, um, one is called neuropathic pain when the nerve itself is abnormal. And the other one is called nociceptive pain when you're just getting normal pain through a normal pathway. Both of them are pain, but they have different causes. Some of the symptoms when you compress nerves can be tingling, unusual tingling in certain areas of your arm and shoulder and chest. This can occur only at night or only after putting your arms into a certain position, like brushing your hair or driving a car. You can also get burning sensations. You can get sensations where touching a feather feels like touching something hot, hyperesthesia. You can get areas of numbness where you don't realize it, but there's no sensation on the skin to pressure or touch. You can get abnormal temperature, abnormal sweating. If you're starting to get the picture, this can be very complex. If you have the vein also compressed or the artery also compressed, you can get your arm falling asleep. You may even get little blood clots that break off from the artery and cause spots on the fingers. You may get swelling of the arm. So it takes a very experienced doctor who has seen TOS cases to understand that not every case is the same. And they need to keep this in mind. They need to keep TOS in mind because there is no one single sign. The literature, medical literature, clearly shows. There is no one test that your doctor does in his or her office that shows TOS. But when you combine those tests and you get imaging, if you do it in the right way, you can figure out and really raise the possibility of the correct diagnosis of TOS. Okay, that wasn't encyclopedic, but it's just a basic idea. All right, we're getting a question from Ontario, California. I had two TOS vascular surgeons dismiss dynamic compression as a positive test for TOS as half of the population have this happen. Obviously, you don't agree. Mm, yep, I think... Uh, it's not me. I think it's the medical literature that doesn't agree. I'm a big fan of reading the medical literature. I'll be the first to admit we have a lot to learn about TOS. There is no one answer yet, but we're getting a lot closer. That's the job of people like me, as well as 
the purpose of my teamwork with doctors around the country so we all understand this and put our heads together for this challenging disease. There are studies in the past that have shown that the arteries in the arm may be partially compressed in normal people. Someone did a test on, I think, 100 medical students and found under ultrasound they could cause, at one point, the artery to narrow. Now, they didn't compare how much narrowing there was. It's possible that everybody gets a little compression. If you put your arms way up behind your head like this as far as you can, you may be able to compress the artery temporarily. They didn't account for a lot of different positions, and they didn't account for the degree of compression. Some patients can get severe compression with a little arm motion. Okay. Now, I'll also tell you this, that we know from CAT scan studies and MRI studies that the veins, the big veins that come back from the arm, can be compressed in about half of normal people. Again, normal meaning no symptoms. But we also know that in about two-thirds of TOS patients, they can be compressed. We also know that some patients get a blood clot in their vein, presumed due to damage from compression of those veins. So there's a spectrum of disease here. We do not know the point at which compression of the veins takes a normal person and damages that vein enough to cause a blood clot. But when there's a blood clot, we call it venous TOS. That's not hard to diagnose. No one's arguing that condition. Clearly, that compression occurs. So there's a case where we know that normal people get compression of the veins. They don't have symptoms. They don't have disease. Other patients, for reasons we don't know, get compression of the veins and they form a blood clot, which is a serious issue and needs to be treated, right? So compression by itself is not the sine qua non, a term which means without which not, okay? That means that you can't do something without your sine qua non. The sine qua non has to be there to make something happen, but by itself, it may not be enough. Necessary, but not convincing, right? Not complete. Now, the studies on compression of the nerves have not been done. So we can't say that compression occurs in half the population. Nobody has shown that in the literature. But there are several very good papers that do show if you take about 30 normal people with no symptoms and you take patients with the clinical diagnosis of TOS and you put them in an MRI machine, arms down and arms up, there are differences between those patient populations. The space between the rib and the collarbone is definitely narrower in the patients with the symptoms who have TOS. The people who quote no compression are usually talking about arterial studies. Arterial compression is rare. There's a sign called an Adsen sign or Adsen's test where he in the 1920s, because he didn't have MRs, he didn't have CAT scans, he didn't have ultrasound, he would hold onto your hand, there's a pulse down here by your wrist, and he would manipulate your position with your head to one side, take a breath in, pull your arm back, and he would try to make the pulse go away because he knew if the pulse went away, the artery was compressed. And his reasoning was if the artery was compressed, well, then the nerves were probably compressed too. But you know what? We do have MRIs now and CAT scans and ultrasounds. And I can tell you that we do not see compression of the arteries and compression of the nerves at the same time. It happens sometimes, but the vast majority of patients have compression of the nerves without compression of the arteries. I'm going to forget compression of the veins for right now. That's another long story that's very interesting. But there is not a correlation. No one's ever shown a correlation between compression of the arteries and compression of the nerves. And let's keep in mind that 95 to 98% of cases of TOS are neurogenic, which means it doesn't matter from here to Skokie. It doesn't matter if you have compression of the artery or if you don't have compression of the artery. Patients clearly get compression of the nerves. It's been shown in any number of forms. Okay? You can't make TOS go away. It's real. There's 3,000 papers in the medical literature from all over the world. And nobody's going to argue the existence of TOS if they've read the medical literature. Okay? We can show on MRI the nerves clearly get compressed. It's not done by me. It's done by me and lots of other people. Okay? So that person who's stating that has got it wrong. They need to do a little bit more reading or they need to say, hey, I'm not the expert in this. Okay? Compression occurs. TOS is real. It's not related to the artery or the vein. The nerve compression occurs by itself in this very complex space. I'm sorry if you've had to argue with your doctors. It's not the first time I've heard this. You shouldn't have to twist your doctor's arms to understand the syndrome, to do a little bit of reading, or to transfer you who somebody 
who is comfortable with the disease. I've had a patient who was an attorney he called me from Florida and he wanted to get one of my studies, but he was uh, under the care of a, a relatively famous TOS surgeon down there. And so I asked him, what's the purpose of getting the study? If it's positive, you're going to surgery anyway. That's what the surgeon has told you. And if it's negative, what are you going to do? What are you going to tell the surgeon? I don't want your recommendation now. So I'd be happy to speak with your surgeon and see what he wants to do. Anyway, the patient did, uh, did get the test and he didn't have TOS by my criteria. The surgeon went ahead and did the surgery anyway. Uh, that was the last I heard. And then the patient called me two years later and said he had not gotten any better at all. Um, the challenging thing for me was that when he went back to the surgeon after the surgery, and six months had gone by, he had no improvement at all. The surgeon just kind of shrugged and said, okay. And now I'm dealing with a patient trying to find him people who will find what's really causing the pain because it's not a matter of whether you've gotten TOS surgery. It's a matter of whether you feel better. That's the patient's point of view. I'm sure you'll all understand. So uh, your two doctors who say, ah, it can't be compression, then fine. Then what will they care if you go to see somebody who really knows the disease? You can arm yourself with some papers from the literature. There are plenty of them out there. If you contact us through our website, we're glad to refer you to a few. But you need to ask your doctor to deal with you as a patient who's in a lot of pain. And please, hear some papers that were referred to me. And I don't think that the artery compression is related to the brachial plexus compression. We'll try to help you with that. Um, but I think for everybody listening, you need to be your own advocate when you um, deal with people like this. And those people need to be hopefully good enough people that they say, I just don't know. Let's get you to somebody who does. I hope that helps you. We have a question now that says, I live in a small town in Ohio. How do I find a qualified TOS doctor? That's Dina. Hi, Dina. Um, first things first, uh, TOS specialists are not just one type of specialty. Some are vascular surgeons, some are neurosurgeons, some are physiatrists, some are neurologists. In addition, we get a lot of TOS patients who are first diagnosed by a physical therapist or a chiropractor who tend to spend a lot of time hands-on with their patients. So the diagnosis is not held by any one group, but uh, the knowledge of TOS is spread unevenly in different communities. It varies from city to city. Uh, number one, we can try if you contact us through our website, tosmri.com. You go to the last column that says news and education, and there's a contact us page on there, and we'll try to help you. Secondly, if you don't have somebody locally, uh, you could do one of two things. You can travel to somebody who's an expert and we'll, we'll connect you with people who are uh, very experienced at TOS. Or you could try to set up a uh, telehealth consult. There are some doctors doing that now, of course, as a result of this uh, COVID, uh, many people didn't have the same contact with their doctors. So several doctors we know will now do teleconsults and they'll visit with you over a video connection. Even though they can't examine you, they can still get a pretty good idea. You know, I'm not a clinician anymore. I used to be. But hopefully they get at least halfway there and they're able to say, I think it's more likely something else. Go see a neurologist for this. Or they may say, you know, I think this really is TOS. I think you should make a visit to somebody who's close, me or somebody else. So I think the two options are to travel to an expert, someone who's experienced, or to do a teleconsult with those doctors who are offering it, who may not give you the full exam, but they can certainly narrow it down, narrow down the possibility either way. Um, next question. It seems that there is a lot of disagreement about TOS. Can you share your thoughts on this? Hi, Julian. Australian people are asking us a lot of good questions recently. Uh, through our mailbox, we get a lot of requests. So uh, a lot of disagreement about TOS. That's true. I think that there's less disagreement about TOS now than there ever has been during my practice time. And I'm happy to see that. So about 20 years ago when I started, we had, um, you know, some local physicians in hospitals and they were in very comfortable positions. They'd been there for years and they would go to court and argue against patients who had gotten TOS from a car accident. And they would say it can't be TOS because... There is no such thing as TOS. It's disputed. I remember one neurologist who um, was in a deposition. And at this time, I had been coaching attorneys about the disease and what questions to ask. And I didn't take it personally, but 
it would bother me when a doctor would go in and hurt a patient's case when the patient certainly deserved a fair hearing. If they had been injured in a motor vehicle accident and were trying to get their medical expenses covered, you know, I think advocating for those patients is fair. So I would coach some of the attorneys and say, you know, ask these sorts of questions. So uh, this doc was going on and on about TOS didn't exist and it was so rare. So the attorney was smart and he said, um, how long have you been practicing? And the doc said, 30 years. He said, okay, uh, how many cases of TOS have you seen? And the doc said, one, maybe. So the attorney said, well, then how are you an expert? To which there was no answer. So uh, turns out the plaintiff's attorney did win that case and it really was TOS. There was no question about it. If somebody just says TOS doesn't exist, that's a red flag, okay? If they have questions about specific parts of it, for example, we don't know the best treatment. We don't know how to treat patients with abnormal brachial plexus pathway versus real compression between the rib and collarbone. Is there a surgeon who says, I'm gonna make a different choice of surgery depending on that? Not a lot of them do that. Those are reasonable questions that professionals and patients can discuss. And there's still more research and more work to be done. When somebody says, hey, I don't need to know about TOS because it's disputed. Okay, number one, the, the mechanism by which it got disputed is completely fallacious. It's not real, not scientific. Anybody who critically reads those papers where Dr. Asa Wilborn said, I'm going to create the category of disputed TOS. You just have to read that and say, well, this doesn't make any logical sense. But it's also intellectually lazy for someone to say that. Yeah, it's disputed. I saw that in a paper once. And so, you know, I don't have to think about it. I don't have to consider it. That's, you know, I don't know what the right medical term is for BS, but that's BS. And it's lazy. So I have discussions all the time with people I work very closely with sometimes who will disagree with me about certain things. And we try to hash it out and say, how could we figure this out next time? That's good for a patient. Maybe not this patient, but the next one maybe. It's good for both of us that we have to hold on to our beliefs until it's time to let them go. We have to support our beliefs. That disagreement is perfectly fine. And there's plenty of it with TOS. It's not the only disease like that. There are other diseases where people still disagree on the best treatment, the best diagnosis. And we try to do research and gather experience and follow outcomes to make that smaller and smaller, that margin between what's known and what isn't known. But when someone just says, I'm gonna dismiss the whole thing because it just ain't there. Well, let them go read some papers. Let me have an argument with them in person or a discussion, however you want to phrase it, where they have to support their viewpoint. But they won't do that. They'll just say, it's so rare, I never see it, but yeah, I'm an expert. Okay. So the disagreement among real professionals who know TOS is about details. The disagreement with people who just don't want to spend the time learning it is just noise. And I think that um, you shouldn't confuse the two. The people who don't put any time into it, you can just wave and smile and drive to the next uh, care provider. Thank you for a very good question, actually. Let's see if I have some more questions I can answer here. I watched the two toseducation.org talks by Art Jenkins. He was really helpful in both of them, especially the one about choosing a surgeon. Thank you. And that's BJ from Biloxi. Yeah, so Art Jenkins is one guy sh sh just sharp, smart as a whip. He's a different specialty than me. He's a neurosurgeon. He's got a lot of experience and some of it's different than me. And we talk a lot about TOS. We have a lot that we agree on. We have a good amount that we say we just don't know. And then we have some stuff that we disagree on. It's entirely professional discussion. I love it. I love talking to somebody that smart. I'm so lucky to be in this field where I meet these incredibly smart people. And if he's picking at my argument and I have to support it, fine. I'm not taking it personally. I can support my arguments. I'm perfectly fine when I say, hey, you know what? I really believe this, but I don't have proof, okay? So I'm gonna keep my mind open. And from people like Art and Tracy Newkirk, who's spoken here and others, when they push me to figure something out and I have to read more or figure out other things, then I've just helped myself and I've helped patients with TOS. So I think um, Art is, is really great. And I highly recommend um, patients who think they have TOS to get a consult with him. I think he's great. Okay. Hi, Michael. I, I know you. Is there any downside to using a massage gun to loosen up the shoulder and neck muscles? So uh, 
I, I used to be an internist. I'm not anymore, Michael. And I uh, don't see patients directly. I talk with lots of patients. I talk with their doctors, talk with physical therapists. So this, I'm saying that because it's a little bit out of my field. Number one, I'd say if you're loosening up your muscles and you're gaining more control of your scapula and you're not increasing your pain, I don't see any direct harm in it. You're not going to do it directly over the brachial plexus, which is deep inside here. Obviously, you're You'd avoid that because it would be very painful. I think in conjunction with a good physical therapist like uh, Steve Talikowski, who's given several talks here, that's probably a better way to get an expert opinion on whether it's okay and how you're doing it. But uh, right off the bat, I don't think there's harm in it if you just stay away from the, the brachial plexus itself. As in this talk, remember, Michael, we were talking about the muscles and how many muscles there are on the shoulder blade and how that can affect the position of the shoulder blade, which I repeat boringly affects the position of the collarbone and the first rib doesn't move. So getting the muscles of the shoulder blade in better balance, loosening them up as you're trying to do, learning how to relax or even how to understand what your shoulder is doing will be helpful in my opinion. Again, though, I'd encourage working with a physical therapist who has a lot more skill and experience with this if he or she does TOS work. Steve Talikowski is one who's great. There are some other ones in the city in San Francisco and in the East Bay, and we can help you try to find those people uh, through our website if you contact us. And you and I have had other conversations, so I'm glad to continue to answer those questions for you. Thank you for this question. Oh, and uh, BJ said, I should have mentioned the talk by Tracy Newkirk too. Yeah, uh, Tracy's great. He, he's, he knows so much about TOS. He never stops asking questions. He and I have a lot of discussions and disagreements, but we always end up saying, how do we figure this out? And we have so much common ground between us. So those discussions, again, it, it's a tremendous benefit for me to have people who ask a lot of questions and who push the envelope. And I think over the past 20 years that I've been working with people like Tracy and more recently with Art Jenkins and lots of others, Fareed Gargoslu is revolutionizing surgery down in Florida. All of these people help move things forward, not just by what they do, but by sharing it with other people and instigating the thought process, pushing the thought process, being critical question askers. So that, that really good question we had about, uh, there's a lot of disagreement about TOS from Australia. Uh, that's a, a really great question. And again, I'll reinforce that, you know, people who discuss it as professionals, who try to resolve some of the challenging issues, those are great disagreements and they end up helping people. So I'm being reminded now, our next live event, The Two Sides of TOS with Dr. Avery. Jim Avery is great. Um, that's going to be Tuesday, June 8th at our usual time, 4.30 Pacific Standard Time. Uh, Jim Avery has a tremendous amount of experience with TOS. He's modified and upgraded and revised his surgery and made great improvements over many years that I've worked with him. Uh, if anybody's met him, he's an awesome guy, really cares for his patients, really intrigued by TOS and always trying to help it get better. Uh, one person I really value as a contributor to the whole community and to stimulating great discussion and thought and just an incredible gentleman. So I really strongly recommend watching his talk. You'll love him after watching him. He's a great guy to ask questions and he uh, can talk about what he's done with probably 30 years now working on TOS patients. It's a tremendously rich experience. All right, uh, if we don't have other questions, I wanna thank everybody for attending who has attended and for people who are viewing this in the future because we have it on YouTube. I will ask everybody to please help support toseducation.org through social media. Please keep attending these. Please send in your suggestions for what we might talk about next and we'll round up doctors who can discuss those topics of most interest. If you have a doctor you'd like us to contact and see if he or she would like to participate, we can definitely do that. Also, my website, TOSMRI.com, has lots of educational material. We're adding a whole bunch of new stuff coming up online within a few days, including a new blog, where I'll be trying to talk about a lot of updates. And we, of course, take people who contact us there and provide them as much guidance, help, connections, advice as possible. Also, uh, it's the best way to inquire about getting our study. Uh, we are always happy to answer questions, and there's never an obligation to get our study. 
Uh, we like to help people and we feel our success is measured in how many people feel better, how many times we find a patient and connect them with the right doctor, even if we're not directly involved, if we just do that. So uh, we're always there to help, TOSMRI.com. It will really help us. This year, we're trying to grow social media. So go to TOSMRI on Instagram, on Facebook, on YouTube, on Twitter. Uh, Twitter, we're just working up our way to doing it now. I've been avoiding it because I have all this work to do on TOS, but we'll be signing into it and creating things now. TOSMRI, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube. Herb, do we have any other questions? All right. So thank you again, everybody, for attending. We'll look forward to seeing you at our next talk, June 8th. Jim Avery, thank you very much.